What's up? This is Russ Dapper Dividends Podcast. You know me, I'll be Russ for the remainder of this right yeah, podcast episode and uh, have a very, a first timer, mind you. Love it. Uh, this is a person who contacted me out of the blue and I was intrigued by the story and what he's done and what he's got going on. So Sean Andro- Androff, Androff, is that, you tell me how yeah, you that's say that's it. it, correct me. It's Androff. You got it, Russ. Nice. So Sean Androff is with us and we're going to just talk about his dividend investing portfolio and what he's got going on. So Sean, just give us the quick, uh, you know, we don't need to go back to Ellis Island and your your relatives, but who are you? Who are you? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, it's good to be on the show, Russ. I listen to you all the time. I'm an early riser, so I do a lot of morning walks and workouts. So it's fun to have you along for the for the uh, for the ride. Um, so kind of the, to cut to where I'm at now. So I uh, grew up in Minnesota, met my wife at college and uh, we both graduated there, got into our careers and um, kind of did the conventional working, which we're still doing, but did the 401ks, did the Roth IRA things, all the things you're supposed to do. And, um, you know, I kind of did that for, you know, eight, nine years, got a financial advisor which was, uh, you know, didn't know much about investing and, um, you know, didn't see a lot of return from like our 401ks and whatnot. It just seemed like we would put, you know, uh, every we maxed both of those out, but nothing really seemed to happen with them except for what we put into them. So, um, uh, you know, about a couple of years ago, so about four years ago in 2018, I just kind of got frustrated with like investing in general because I felt like, the only time my accounts ever went up is when I like physically made deposits into them. I wasn't seeing like big returns. Also, you know, we, we kind of growing up, my wife and I were both like our parents are really big into saving money and not overspending, which was which was good. You know, we, we paid off our house young, I think when we were 31 or 32 so that we were we kind of did the Dave Ramsey thing and paid down debt aggressively. But the investing part was always a little bit of a mystery. So I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this because I'm a, such a big dividend fan now and obviously a fan of your show, but I didn't really even know what a dividend was until about four or five years ago. So I always thought, you know, to make money in the stock market, you had to buy a share at 100 and sell it at 120 and that was your profit. So um, kind of fast track to 2018, uh, I was on vacation with my family and my, and my brother and I were, went, went for a long walk. We were in Branson, Missouri, if you've ever been been there never been yeah it's fun it's fun so uh we were both kind of griping about like man it seems like you know we we get our statements every month and they're you know wildly higher or lower there's lots of swings back and forth and it just doesn't there's like no traction you know you keep putting money into these things and they're just not doing anything so um i we stopped investing totally into the market um and then COVID happened so this is really kind of where the story takes off so 2019 uh, for about a year, I was just putting extra money I had from my my normal sales job and my commissions into a uh, just a regular bank account, mm-hmm. checking savings account. And uh, when COVID happened, uh, I'm in the staffing business. And so obviously, you know, people aren't hiring a lot when there's a pandemic, you know, and whatnot. So um, it was a little bit quieter. And I was just, you know, thinking a little bit more about work and life and investing. And uh, I was really, you know, intrigued by Warren Buffett and wanted to know like what is this guy's deal like how did he make all like what was his story and i'm a big reader so i got uh, a book called warren buffett stock portfolio and uh it's a great read and you know russ about halfway through it what kind of struck me was that you know here's a guy who was buying great companies when they were down and just holding them you know and then the book talks a lot about dividends and you know and how that generates income. And then these companies raise their dividends, which I didn't know that was a thing, you know, a kager. I never heard of that, which I just kind of learned about that a year or two ago, probably mm-hmm. on your podcast. But so then, you know, kind of being a nerd, I read that. And then I read um, a couple other dividend books, Dividend Investing Your Way to Financial Freedom was one. Uh, Millionaire Next Door yep. was a great book. I read that. That was kind of motivating. And then um, Dividend Investing the comprehensive beginner's guide to learning dividend investing step by step, which is just, you know, when you're kind of reading those, the big takeaway for me was like, this is not super complicated. Now that I've been doing it for a while, there's a lot of nuance and things to learn. But um, so anyways, I 
kind of took all that money that was on the sidelines and, you know, bought into like Chevron, J and J, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, McDonald's, Lowe's, all these, you know, great, awesome companies that were on, you know, 60, 70% on sale during wow. that time. And, uh, that was, that was kind of the beginning of it. So I hope that kind of brings you up to speed of where I am now. Yeah. So a couple questions. First, um, yeah. financial advisor, how, how much did that cost? I've, I've always been curious about financial advisors. Yeah. So it was actually, uh, a, a neighbor, a friend of a neighbor kind of a thing. And, um, they were great. Uh, the guy that I worked with was excellent. And what was really cool is he was really a teacher because I was fascinated um, by all this stuff. I kind of got into the fire com community, you know, the mm -hmm. financial independent retire early, you know, group kind of a deal. And so uh, I had a really ambitious goal to make work optional at 40. That was something that was really important to me uh, is just to not have to work and choose to, because uh, I think that just is a it makes work more fun and being in sales, you tend to do better when you're not pressing, you know, and like desperate. So uh, anyways, when I met with him, um, we worked together for about eight years and I would just every commission I had passed, you know, paying my you know normal expenses, but hand over to him. Uh, they charge a one percent fee of your total assets. Okay. So if you have a million dollars, it's a ten thousand dollar a year fee. What was you know, again, I had no idea how to do this on my own. To me, it was very scary. I didn't know mutual funds and ETFs. And like I said, I didn't even know what a dividend was. I had never heard of one, although I heard the phrase it pays dividends. I never knew what that even was from. So um, once you know, I started reading and then I, I got onto your podcast and a couple other ones and then started going on YouTube and learning things. And so what I started doing was as I was working with him, I set up my own little Vanguard account. I think I put like thousand dollars in it. Um, I kind of started with some index funds, like some of the the, the, the big, you know, S&P 500, the ones that track that. Um, and I just started doing my own thing for a while, uh, while I was working with him. And then about in 2022 is when I was like, listen, this is like my thing. I'm, I'm really into this. It's not that difficult for me to buy 10 shares of Pepsi and never sell it, you know, because I really don't plan on ever selling these things. So um, I kind of had this philosophy of this might sound weird, not that I grew up on a farm, but being from the Midwest, which I know you are too, Russ. Oh, but, yeah. yeah, hater. <laughs> yeah. So I had this kind of thought of like, you know, there's there's like beef cattle and those are like steers that you would buy and sell for meat. Mm -hmm. And that's like an IPO, an IPO or like, you know, um, uh, a stock that kind of blows up, right? That would be like a T-Mobile, right? So, because I know you've talked about that stock in the past and that's one I haven't bought too because it doesn't fit in. But then I looked at it like a dairy farmer. So my thought was like, you know, if I just keep buying J&J &J and P&G and Clorox and Kimberly Clark and AbbVie and Abbott and all the, those are my little dairy cows. And I just, if you just keep adding them, and we're never going to sell them. They're just here for milking, if you will, the dividends. Um, that was kind of motivating for me. And where, where it kind of took off is when I'm sure they all, I'm sure every um, brokerage has this, but Vanguard has a little, um, you know, you can click down and see your dividend income. And so that first quarter, I think my income that quarter was like $28 yeah. in dividend. <laughs> Like Philip Morris was two dollars and Altria was three or whatever. It was cool because I, and maybe you can relate to this, Russ. I'm sure your listeners can. What was what was cool is that it was like I had a little partner in crime. It just wasn't my wife and I working. There was this other. It's funny we we call him Vandy because of Van Dyke. So like we we have like this hypothetical dude whatever that works nonstop twenty four seven. And so um, you know then the second quarter of that year you know it went up to. I don't know, 600 or something, because we were really funneling into it. Um, and then the third quarter, it grows. And, you know, now it's, you know, close to 10,000 a quarter, which is pretty serious money. That's adding up. And, um, you know, I, I kind of put my top, I don't know if you want me to go through my top 10 list, but I've kind of got a list of like, these are the ones that I really like that are, um, you know, kind of generate the most income for me. But it's just been really motivating to see that grow. I want to go back to you saying that it was kind of scary thinking about doing it on your own. And it's just, it's really unfortunate that a lot of us are never taught that you probably don't need a, it, for most people, you could just buy the S&P 500, just buy SPY. Uh, that's probably what I'm gonna end up doing with my girls. Like, you know, you've heard me talk about it. All y'all all that listen have heard me say that. It's just, 
I'm sending the message. They're just, they don't want to receive it. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. Every individual is their own person. I can't control yeah. that, but I'm going to tell them you have to be investing. And if you oh, don't, yeah. you know, it'll be SPY or VOO, just one of the low, super low cost index funds that tracks the whole market. You're going to get what, eight, yep. 9% a year on average, just reinvest yep. it. You don't have to worry about it, but you know, and, and you said $10,000, that's pretty apropos because you're probably going to start making that money back that you paid uh, the advisor friend. Yeah. Um, was there any, regret- was yeah. there any pushback on his end when you said you were going to kind of do it on your own or was he? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's kind of funny. So it felt like I was like breaking up with someone, you know, it's weird because we, we were kind of buddies, you know, and he's a great, he's a really, really good guy. And um, taught me a lot about the market. And anytime I ever had a question, he would kind of, I was very, um, you know, attentive. So again, it, it's, it's not like I had a bad experience, but, you know, I just wanted to, it's a passion, it's a hobby. And I wanted to do it on my own. It's uh, once I kind of figured out these are some good funds to buy. And kind of like you said, I mean, I, I like for ETFs, I like VOO, mm-hmm. VIG, VYM, uh, VTI, all those kind of uh, funds. I also do Noble as well. But, um, you know, I just thought I can buy this and just do this on my own. And so when I, I told them what I was doing, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to I think I'm going to close my account, you know, and um, I think I had 700,000 in there or something. Yeah, so nice. it's kind of a lot to roll out and do my own thing with. But, um, you know, he was really cool about it. He was just like, are you sure? He's like, you know, it, it can get he, he did caution me. He's like, I have to warn you, you know, there are people who uh Dividend investing can be really boring. You know, you're not chasing IPOs. We're not doing calls and puts and swing trading and all that kind of, you know, exciting stuff. And I'm like, honestly, boring is great because I'm not one one piece of advice I would share uh, with your listeners that I've learned the hard way is don't I, I don't try. I try not to look at my total value of the brokerage. Like, I don't like to look at the I, I mean, I, I see it. But what is more important to me is not the total value of it. It's the income growth, because that is what's really motivating. And the whole point of this is is income replacement or income, you know, supplemental income. So it can get discouraging when you only look at, you know, it was one point this and now it's one point that. What's really cool is to look at like, okay, last last quarter it was 10,000. This quarter it's 12 or whatever. So um, but yeah, it was a little awkward, you know, and uh, but Overall, it was good. I, I was a little nervous for that call because I felt bad. I mean, I don't know. It's well, kind of weird. Anytime but. you're going to be taking money away from somebody, you know, they're going to be, uh, they're going to, I would give pushback like, yeah, hey, you know, it's a dangerous place out there, Sean. You might want to rethink yeah. it. I love that analogy of the dairy cow versus the the cat, the steer for beef, you know, because, yeah. and, and it's going to be the, the age old eternal question. And I know I did that video where Warren Buffett shows that if we owned a business, and you had the dividend route or you had the route of just selling off shares. But instead of paying out the dividend, you're reinvesting that money year after year that that would grow faster. But, right. you know, there's a good and a bad for every strategy. I don't care what it is. I know some everyone has their sacred cow strategy, right? But mm-hmm. you can find fault in anything. And, you know, yeah. I, I've I've if you're on the live streams ever, there's uh, Casey, uh, Caitlin Kate is a member. She's, you know, always trying to talk me into different things she's looking at. And I'm, you know, I say, well, personally, my thing is like, yeah, I know some stocks that don't pay dividends and that, that you know, that's one of the knocks on dividend investing. And that's fine is you're going to miss a lot of the non-dividend paying companies. But right. for me and my goal and what my wife and I, you know, she's on board, not, you know, not as much into it as I am, but uh, what we like is what you addressed on is people working for us all over the world, 24 hours yeah. a day, seven days a week. Just you, you're hit, you have th- hundreds of thousands of employees, which is such a cool thought. But what we really want is to just not have to sell stocks, just have that income coming in yeah. and just not selling off stocks. And you know, and to pass it on to the kids to have a more of something to um, give to them when our, yeah. when our time is up, when our number is called and our tickets punched. But it's just what we want. And like I say, you know what? I understand you got some picks that are going to blow up, but we just 
that's what we're comfortable with is building. And I got, you know, I got a little smidgen of the portfolio. I like, I just started investing in Hero Health. Uh, I did months yep. of looking yes. into it, and yep. I, I really like the company. So, I mean, I probably get to like fifty shares of it, and it's not a lot. But anyway, so I like yeah. that analogy you have of the dairy cow. You're not killing the dairy cow to eat. You know, maybe unless it's tough times you are, but, right, exactly. but yeah. hopefully yeah. we're not, we're just, it's, it's just self-sustaining. I love it. Um, your portfolio, your you money. mentioned, I heard the one point, I heard that point in there, which is a big yeah. number that everybody's trying to get to. So you obviously yeah. have alluded to it. You are over a million dollars in your portfolio, which yep. a lot of us want to be it's there. So I have time. two questions, two questions. Yeah, go one for it. is. Uh, again, remind us how long you started building that. And I know you said you had about 700K when you rolled it yeah. in to do what you're doing. So when did you start actively building that? And then two, you had said you were buying like Chevron and PepsiCo and, and things of that nature. So yeah. um, did you have any method to picking those when you did or were you were you buying a lot during the, the pandemic collapse? So you you shared with me yeah. what you got. You got a lot. You got a lot, Sean. So yeah, well, how did you start picking them? So we, I mean, we just we we got into good career paths and jobs. And you know, I've been at my company seventeen years. My wife's been at her company eighteen years. So we're, we're kind of like old school. Like you know, worked hard in school, got good jobs, and just stuck with them. And you know, like I said, we so we've been working on this for I guess you know twenty over twenty years now. It, it adds up. But um, the big thing for me was. Uh, so, for example, like I, I like to buy companies that I see every day, right? So, like I, I like and I like duopol duopolies. I kind of call them push pull stocks. So, one thing I kind of this has probably been about two years, but like, and we do a lot of road trips with the kids, and we're out, you know. And so, I guess one thing I really like about dividend investing too is like, you know, when I go to the grocery store and I see Kellogg's Frosted Flakes or General Mill, you know, Rice Krispies and all these different brands, you know, and uh, Mendelez, my kids like half their snacks are Mendelez brands or Smuckers. And so uh, I think part of the fun has been trying to like teach the kids a little bit about like, this is craft. They make they have mac and cheese, you know, they have like Heinz craft ketchup and this is the company and they're 11 and nine. So they roll their eyes and I'm sure they're like, dad, we get it. McDonald's is a good company, but um to answer your question, you know, I, I just looked at like, what are all the main segments of the industry? And then I really got into like the dividend king, aristocrats and champions of like, who are the companies that have been around a really, really long time, who have really consistent, you know, payments, who have grown their dividend, who have wide economic moats, who have relatively lower payout ratios, have good earnings per share and not auto whack, you know, um, PE ratios. and not that I'm like an expert at all this stuff mm -hmm. at, by any means. I'm really not. I just I just kind of been looking at like Chevron's a pretty good company. They've been around a long time and it's hard to have Sean's oil company. You know, it's hard to, to compete with a company like that and, or Coca-Cola. Like we go to zoos and bush gardens and, you know, I was at SeaWorld the other weekend and everywhere you go, it's Coke and Pepsi. I love it, dude. And I got to I got to stop. Like you just I, I just see Warren Buffett saying with Coca-Cola, saying if you gave me a couple billion dollars i would not know how to create a competitor a serious competitor to coca-cola so yeah i love it exactly so it's like you know and then i like um you know like waste management or public services like so like the duopolies in my mind are like verizon at t mm -hmm. um you know there's a whole bunch of them but uh, and I don't buy a lot of tobacco stocks, but I do like the yield on them. Like Altria is kind of one of my favorites. I like Philip Morris, but I mean, I love staples like P and G yeah. Colgate, uh, Pepsi Coke, and then like Lowe's home Depot. I also like, um, energy companies like Southern company, Duke energy. And I'm a big fan of Kimberly Clark, Unilever. So the back end, and then, so what I've been kind of doing too, Russ is like, and it's not an exact science. It's really more intuitive, but. I, I sort of look at my portfolio and um, I, I guess when I was, I should say younger, but like five, four or five years ago, I was really chasing yield. So I was like, wow, 9% yield. That's way better than like 1%. That's like nine times better. But you know what you realize there's a little bit more risk. And then uh, I, I never really knew about the Kager and the, the growth, you know, how much is the yield? Grow I mean, how much percentage of the yield is growing? So now I kind of take more of like a holistic approach where like I really like Visa, UPS and AbbVie 
for like growing dividend stocks, you know, versus like an Altria, which is a really high yield, but not much growth. And I, I've heard you talk about that on your show too. So I kind of just, I'm, I sort of, whenever I have a little bit of extra funds, um, one thing I like to do that might be helpful is I, I sort of kind of created a, I like, so let's say I have a $10,000 that I have, I can invest in mm. uh, at this stage right now, I'm 42. I like to put 20% in cash. Vanguard actually has a four and a half percent savings rate, which is pretty phenomenal. I mean, it's just savings. And then I take uh, 30%, which would be 3000. And I chop that up into like $500 segments. And I really love SCHD. I know everybody does in our community, but it's a great, it's a great ETF. Um, I've been dabbling in Jeppy. I bought my first few shares of that recently. I've been um, thinking about it. I'm close. I, I'm not there yet. Yeah. Just because it's so new. It's so new. Yeah. And so you've 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 done your dabbling. I, I'm probably going to do some dabbling. Yeah, I just a little bit, and then I love the BOO, VIG, and VYM. So, I, for example, I'll take five hundred dollars and put five hundred into five of those ETFs, right? And then the other five thousand, I might pick ten really good blue chip stocks um, like the Chevrons, like I mentioned, Abby and um, UPS Waste Management, Union Pacific. Canadian National Rail, I love that one. Uh, Toronto Dominion, you got me onto that. I'm big into that now. EPD, I could go on, but like then I, I kind of just do ten of those, five hundred each, and then that's it for the month or whatever whatever time frame that is. So I, I kind of just do like lump sum investing whenever I have some funds to invest. But I, I have enjoyed kind of splitting up, up into like a little bit of cash, ETFs, and then you know blue chip safe dividend stocks, but I, I like the duopolies. That's a big thing for me. Yeah, the duopoly. I heard you say Verizon, AT&T, and then you've seen me share the chart when you throw T-Mobile on there. And it's just, I know, it's sad. It I just know. total return cleans their clocks. Yeah, it's, it does. it's, it's kind of weird to, you know, when I start this, I'm like, oh, I really like this stock and I want to tell people about it. And then to hear people say, well, you said you, you know, you bought it and I looked into it and I bought it. And I always think like, oh God, please let it, do well and come, you know what I mean? Yeah, because, exactly. yeah. But the point of it is, is at least I'm, I own it. I have, I think a hundred, almost 130 shares of TD and yeah. like I have conviction. So I would feel worse if I didn't own something and I was telling people like, you should buy this. And then people bought it and then it went down and yeah. I, I never owned it. So hey, right, at least right. can, <laughs> I got skin in the game, you know, so it's exactly, I guess that'll help me sleep a little bit better at night. So yeah. how many individual stocks do you have right now? Um, oh, good question. I, I, if I had to guesstimate, it's probably like 70 ish. Yeah. So that's lot. probably more than I would want. But when I first kind of got started, I was just kind of, Honestly, it was kind of like the Wild West. I was just gobbling up like good companies in a lot of segments. And now I kind of have like a top 30 that I really like and I kind of just work those in. But um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I I got and some of them I don't have a lot in. Like I think Aflac, I have like 15 shares mm -hmm. and, you know, um, Tootsie Roll is one that's uh, kind of uh, been around forever. That's I've got some in Campbell's Ooh. soup and whatever. Tootsie yeah, roll. but you know, I, hear, I hear Tootsie Roll. You know what their stick is, right? What's that? Uh, their reverse split every year. Oh. Or not? No, not reverse oh. split. They split every year. Reverse split is oh. the bad one. If a company reverse splits, they're usually doing that because they're facing being delisted from an exchange because the share prices come down too much. Hello, okay. uh, Aurora Cannabis. That was one of my yeah, early lessons yeah. on. But yeah, Tootsie Roll does a, I think it's like a 1.04 for one every year. Something like that. Okay. So I think for every, I don't know, it's it's a weird, I can't remember. I've, I've done a video on it a long time ago, but every single year they split the stock and it works out to, yeah, I'm like a 3% because they have a small yield. But then if you were yes, to theoretically yeah. sell, the shares you get from the split. So maybe it was something like if you have a hundred shares, you get 104 every year, I think is okay. what it turns yeah. into. So yeah, if you were to just sell those four shares plus the yield, uh, that's, that's kind of what it would, but yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I do. There's, there's yeah. so much to learn. It's just there's this, so much. And like, yeah, I, I like like Aries capital. Uh, that's a good one. I like main street capital, a realty income. I, I kind of like those REITs, you know, and, um, uh, the other ones that I like are the, um, Pembina, 
um, some of the pipeline companies have good yields and they're pretty safe. So again, it's like kind of mixing in. Sometimes I'll add a little visa just to get the growth and UPS. And then if you want to hammer the yield, I'll get some EPD or whatever. It's just, it's kind of like you're sculpting a little bit to keep it well-rounded, but it's a blast, man. And I love your show. It's fun to listen to. It's a great community. <laughs> it is. And <clears throat> you said Aries Capital and Main Street Capital. That all stemmed for me from Ian Lopik's interview with Greg, the Dividend Monster. I don't know if you caught that. I know I talked about it. And his turning me on to The Income Factory by Stephen Bavaria, what is interesting, yes. really interesting book. And yeah, I got to read. I, yeah, because I always had, I, I've looked into very briefly at some of the BDCs and I never really understood them. And yeah. they were built to pay a higher yield. But, you know, it's... Uh, I think people are going through it with, no, oh, I don't remember who, but there's point being that even if they have a cut, usually it's not for very long. Uh, they'll raise that dividend again, but I don't know they're just, they're built to pay out a higher dividend yield. That's like the simplest yep. way to explain it. And yeah. So anyway, I bought Aries capital and main street capital. I know my guy, Ryan Williams likes uh, orc. Um, I think, or Owl Rock, I think. Owl Rock Capital. I think it's ORCC. So anyway, but the thing is, is that the dividends are not qualified with the yes. uh, Aries Capital, with the BDCs. But I finally bought 100 shares of Aries, you know, a couple months yeah. ago in the taxable account. Because right. I'm like, you know what? I'll take the small hit on the taxes, but I want to get more income coming into that, yeah. like a little bit higher yield. Because, uh, you know... I'm not getting any younger and eventually I'm going to start needing that, that dividend income to, to pay bills. So do you, do you think about that? Are you looking at something with a high growth, a high dividend, uh, not maybe not a super high starting yield, but something that has like really nice uh, growth. I think, I think uh, yeah. Starbucks might be something that's like that. That yeah. gets pretty good. I like Starbucks. Yeah. I heard somewhere they're building, what is it, like one new Starbucks every nine minutes in China for the next three years. Like the growth is outstanding. And it, again, I, I get out a lot and there's Starbucks everywhere and they're packed. So it's like, you know, I think for me, the couple of weird ones are like 3M. 3M's kind of been a head scratcher. I used to buy a lot of that. What are you I'm doing like, with What are you doing with 3M? What do you think? Well, I'm not selling anything because I don't yeah. sell anything. But yeah. I, I haven't been buying more of it because of the lawsuits and the, it just keeps going down. I, I don't. I mean, but it's so big and they they're in so many products. So I'll probably pick up some more. But do you like them now or? Yeah. So I had said I was going to buy. I was going to buy more when it went into the low 90s, which it did. But I think I bought three shares in the Roth at like 99.50 or something when it went okay. under 100. But just just in the Roth, I'm going to hold those for a long time. And I, I don't know. I, I could think it could get ugly. It's going to be public sentiment. The market, you know, yeah. we always say the market doesn't like uncertainty. So they had what looks like they might have a settlement with the PFAS, the forever chemicals. I think 10 billion is a number I saw, but right. the, the earplugs, the, that's going to be the big one. And it's I know, yeah. I know we've seen some uh, reports that I think are a little high. They say it could be a hundred billion dollars, but wow. I, I don't think they're going to be bankrupted, but I think they've been preparing for this for this for a while because they give a penny raise a year. And they've, 3M has just been yeah. giving really, really token dividend increases. I think yeah. they're trying to preserve cash. So I'm, I don't know. I'm not buying. I'd love to see them jump into the like 130s, 140s, and I might, I might think yeah. about exiting. But you know, I'm like you, That's man. I'm. This is you guys know me. I love to. My fault is falling in love with what I buy and holding too long. So I'm just, I'm trying to look I'm for better. You. I'm just trying to look for better quality. Yeah. The other one that's kind of a head scratcher is Walgreens. Cause there's a billion of those things everywhere you go. There's like, you know, nine Walgreens everywhere, but that's another one that I've been kind of cool on. I used to buy a lot of it and once in a while I'll pick it up, but it's another one that I'm not real sure. I'm kind of pausing on that one because that it just keeps going down and they're, I think they're, um, Earnings per share is like really low. It's not good. So I don't know if you're into that one at all. No, I, <clears throat> I don't own them outright. But, you know, I will say that actually I'm, I'm just started reading value investing. Uh, 
Bruce Greenwald's book. It's going to be a lot. I just started it today. It's like 18 hours long, you know, audio book. Okay. And nice. I'll probably read the I'll probably read the physical copy at some point. But yeah, and they were talking about like the ugly stocks. Sometimes the best opportunities is when a stock has been down for two or three years. People hate it. The market hates it. Everyone's soured on it. And if it's yeah. a, if so, the, the idea is if it's something that you can see it recovering from, then it's a good time to usually buy that. And I haven't really looked into Walgreens, but, you know, like Target, we can t- touch on Target. It's the lightning rod right yeah. now. Everybody's bagging on it, but I've been buying Target. Uh, it was like $125 today when we're recording this, which is crazy. Yeah, and going down that 10 days in a row, I think. I yeah. just, I, yeah, I don't have any more money left right now because of our trip and this and that. But I'm actually looking at, okay, what else can I sell to buy more of Target? Because yeah. I just, you know, I, I put that I was buying it, got a lot of flack on Twitter from a bunch of people <laughs> I've never seen before. It's amazing what happens just in terms of the market, how the sentiment can drive stuff when, you know, because if you look at their earnings per share and their PE ratio, they're both really good. I mean, they're great. They're yeah. a good line. And it's, so you're, to your point, it's a, obviously a quality business. Yeah. You know, so didn't <clears> you? they've got a few headwinds. Uh, foot traffic is down, obviously. Um, the other thing is that, and it's not just them, the whole retail sector that they're in has been yeah. saying that the consumer is starting to spend less and less and less on the discretionary items. So, you're, yeah. you know, your lawn furniture, your couches, TVs, just things like that. It's just the demand is drying up, but it will return. It will return one right. day. So, so this yeah. is a good point of showing people and saying that, in my opinion, I think these are temporary headwinds. It might be a lengthy storm, but the storm will end, the clouds will part, the sun will, the sun will come out again, and yeah. it's going to it's going to be okay for Target. I think 10 years from now yeah. people will barely remember this cuz there'll be some yeah. new thing, hopefully not with some Target. Other. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and to your point too, I mean like uh that's that's why I always like picking up more Kimberly Clark and Colgate Palmolive and Unilever and I just those are more dairy cows, you know, no matter, and those are pretty, pretty low key. People need tissue, you know, Kleenex and toilet paper. And it's, uh, so anytime I can grab more of that stuff, I'm, I just keep adding more to it because I feel like it's so low risk. They, they have good growth. So it, it's fun, man. Like I said, I, I wish my only regret is, you know, I'm 42. I, I just wish I would have known this when I was 18, 19, you know, like uh, you 20, both. They, don't, they don't touch, they don't teach it anywhere. I mean, like, again, like, I, I had to learn it from reading a book. You know, it's crazy to me. So I, that's why I, keep up the good work because, you know, getting the stuff out there is good. Hopefully people pick up on this earlier in life. Yeah. So we could segue into that. So you said you wish you'd knew it. Now, what what is what's been a lesson that you've learned? What's something either a lesson or what, you know, if you could tell your 20 year old self one thing, what would it be? What would you say to that young guy full yeah, of dreams? <laughs> right. Don't let the don't let the dreams get crushed. I would say, you know, um, you just getting a solid ETFs like an SCHD or a VOO that that pay a dividend or VIG, VYM, those kinds. Um, but just being consistent. You know, if you got a little bit extra money, uh, I think I, I, I heard this on I think it was Choose Fi, which is like a, a, a different podcast on Brad Fire Barrett. Movement. Brad Barrett, yeah. Jonathan Mendoza, yeah. who's no longer yes. on the show. Yes. So they, what they were talking about the other day, which I thought was fascinating, was uh, for every hundred dollars a month that you you know can invest or save or whatnot, that's thirty thousand dollars less that you'll need when you retire. And the thinking was that it's you know twelve hundred dollars times twelve months, twelve hundred dollars in a year. And if you let's say you retire for thirty years, that's that times thirty. So that was kind of interesting, you know, like learning that just if you have a little bit extra money buy some, you know, you could do a, an ETF like that. I mean, I, like you've said before, I think it's really motivating to buy individual stocks and it's mm-hmm. fun. I think it teaches you about businesses and it makes just, it's cool. Like, you know, I, I go to get my uh, newspaper and I see the garbage truck drive by and ours is in Republic services. And I'm like, Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm a tiny little bit of an owner of that. You know, it's kind of, I take the kids to McDonald's, you know, and I'm like, Hey guys, I got the McRib. You know, it's like, you know, it, it, it's just kind of more exciting to do that. But I think I would tell a younger me to start early, to stay consistent. Um, don't chase yield. 
uh, be diverse. It's okay to sit on some cash because when the market, if there's never, never another global pandemic, things can plummet in price. You know, it was just serendipitous that that it worked out. But um, and just you know, um, don't like I said, don't don't obsess about the total value because that that'll come. But just be encouraged by the income growth. That is what's really exciting, and for me personally, that has been um, really motivating. Uh, one little t- one little uh, tidbit: if you whatever that number is at the end of the year, take that and divide it by two thousand and eighty, and that's your hourly wage for your you know little income producer. So it was funny years ago. I was like, "Hey, our little Vandy's making you know two dollars and twenty cents an hour. If you're working whatever." And, you know, now it's like, you know, making whatever, $20 an hour. And so it's, it's, uh, that to me is a good lesson. It's, it's more motivating to watch the growth. That is so cool, man. I love that. Your little Vandy. I mean, that's like a spin on right. Mr. Market, but in a better way. I mean, that's, that's, that is somebody that is working for you and bringing nonstop, you extra yeah. cat nonstop. And so that 200, you said divide it by 280. That's, uh, 2080. 2080. Yeah, so there, uh, yeah, there's 2080 like work hours in okay. a year because it's 50 times 40 and you know whatever. There's two I, weeks usually holiday. I I need to do that because when I've done the hourly thing, I'll just do it by you know hours in a day. So if it was like, yeah theoretically do that 2000, you know, yeah. yeah. So if it's like you know whatever the math would be for whatever, but uh, that that's kind of a fun little uh, exercise because you're like, how's my little worker guy doing in terms of hourly pay, you know, and it's fun to watch that go up. But I think if I wasn't doing that, it would be more discouraging. And I think my former financial advisor was probably alluding to like, it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because if you're just looking at your total value, it doesn't go up a lot over time. It takes, it takes a while, but the thing you don't get when you just, when you don't dividend and uh, dividend invest is you don't get to see the income growth. So that's a big driver for me. Right. Yeah. And, and again, it, and like you said, when I look at on my Schwab, on my app, I, I have it swiped over. So it just shows the investment income. I don't even look yeah, at what the portfolio value is. I don't Smart. care. I mean, as long yes. as my investment income is steady or going up, then I'm happy. And it's just yeah. a great psychological trick because if the, and, you know, speaking of saying you, you wish you had some cash, two, two things from what you said I want to address. One of them was that telling your younger self to buy ETF. So for me, I would say like, look, if, if you want to analyze and get to know businesses, like I'm a weirdo because I think it's cool. And I'm, I'm reading and I'm, I'm always reading three books at a time. Um, but yeah, exactly. I'm reading another one on analyzing financial <laughs> statements um, by John. My problem is finishing them. I start a bunch and then I. Exactly. And I, I enjoy it. I like looking at financial statements, trying to see what a business is doing. But I would tell people, like, if you don't want to do that, if you don't really care, you're going to be at the mercy of other people's decisions about it and opinions. But if you don't want to, like you said, just ETF. Look, you could even buy a dividend focused one, like you said, with just SCHD, the easy one. Well, I will say too, with the with the advisor, I know a lot of people have uh, wealth managers and I'm not like anti wealth managers. I don't want to portray that. But um, if you have an interest in doing this and you take a little like, you know, bold step of faith uh, and you start playing with it, which is what I did. I didn't I kept I, I did this on the side for a couple of years until I realized this isn't that scary and it's actually a lot of fun. But, um, you know, those fees add up a lot when you start talking about yeah. that every year. Yeah. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, it's not as uh, not as difficult as that. Sometimes I think it's meant to be. Or it it does. seems to be. And I, I know what I was going to say about you said, don't worry about having a little bit of cash. And every time I have a little bit of cash and the market starts to go down, like on day one, I just spend it all. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Here we yeah. go. And then, you know, yeah. a week and a half later. But because I'm so paranoid, because all right. of a sudden yeah, now so. market crashes last like a week. Or the I know. pullbacks are weak. And I'm like, well, I thought we were just getting stuck. Like, I want to see a dip and a prolonged yeah. dip, like for two months. Right. So I can just really buy. But it's just like, dude, I blink and then we're right back up. And I'm like, what happened? Like, yeah. the, the dip well, lasted I, two days, you know? It's a, it's a good point, though, Ross, because like, if you think about it, like for us dividend investors, like we're not really like, you know, watching the Dow every every five minutes or checking our portfolio every every day because it's like, 
Clorox is still going to make their dividend payment if the market's down, you know, and so is Chevron. And, you know, it's, so it's kind of a, it's not irrelevant, but it kind of is of what the market does on a day to day or week to week basis. It doesn't really affect what we're doing, you know, which yeah. is really kind of refreshing in a way. And like you said, uh, it, we're buying a business. We're not buying a stock ticker. You know, the, the stock market is a market of stocks and we're buying businesses. And as long as the business is still a good business, then that's when you can get those disjointed values that Mr. Market presents you. And that's when a lot of the super investors like Warren Buffett, he actually, he said one of the best things that can happen when he buys a stock. And if it were to drop 50% the next day, he's overjoyed because he's, well, I guess the caveat would be that something detrimental to the the life of the, yeah. the business didn't didn't happen. Right. But yeah, if if you buy it and it drops the next day, you can buy more. It's like it's what right. you should hope for is that it can stay down. So speaking of buying stocks when they're down, what what's a stock that you really like right now? One, maybe two picks. What's kind of at the yeah. tippy top of your uh, your buy there's, list? There's there's two that are kind of down right now. So Toronto Dominion's down uh, a little bit, and I, I love that one. I think you turned that, me onto that one. So I've been picking up more of that. Uh, I also read Kiplinger magazine. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've read that before. Your listeners do. Um, that they they usually have their top dividend picks in there. And I think a few months ago they talked about EPD, oh, um, yeah. and that's another really good one that I think it's got about a seven and a half percent yield. But that was a, a top pick for them. So. Those two, uh, I'm I'm adding more to when I can, um, but you know I, I don't I don't really chase like the 52 week lows again. Like I I really I've been I've kind of gone down a, um, a wormhole on uh, um, waste management because they they've got about a 17 year a 17 percent growth rate for the last five years in a row, if my math is correct. But they have really been growing their their dividend, and you know people need garbage service, so it's like. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff like UPS has been awesome with their growth. So I'm kind of more interested in just like the good companies that are growing um, instead of like, um, I just don't have the time with young kids to look up what the highs and lows are and I don't have all the fancy alerts. So it's yep. more just like, hey, I'm just gonna buy some more of a good stock. If I can get some more Apple and Microsoft for long-term growth, um, lower yields, but, but good long-term growth too. You know, that's, that's been my thought. I will say that as one who enjoys the whole idea of valuations and net present value and discounted cash flows, you know, my biggest gripe with that is you're predicting the future. You have to try to figure out 10 years from now what the cash flows are going to be and then discount that yeah. back to today. And it's just like, there's so, I mean, uh, there was one investor, I don't remember who said it, but he said the problem with discounted cash flows is that it's like looking through the Hubble telescope. If you turn it one inch in either direction, you're looking at a different galaxy. Yeah. And yes, it's kind of the true. same, it's the same way. And I mean, so my thought is, is like when I did with PepsiCo, I said, okay, I'm pretty confident that they're still going to be in demand 10 years and probably even 20 years from now. So if yep. they're still a good business, people are going to want good businesses. Good businesses are always going to be in demand. And I looked back at the chart and I said, wow, in like the early part of the 2000s, Pepsi was like, I think 40 something dollars a share, maybe 60. I don't remember exactly. But e either yeah. way, I'll bet you I could have found somebody there that says, nah, I'm not touching Pepsi at 60 bucks. Yep. It is stupidly overvalued right now. And then yes. you fast forward to 2023 where it's pushing uh, $200 a share and all the dividends yeah. that were paid out. And my thought was like, you should just over like, it's such a subjective thing. So yeah. I and to your point, yeah. Russ, the back then the PE ratio was like in the, was like 41 or something. And then people were like, Oh, that's crazy. That's way yeah. too high. And right now, right now it's at 37.82, but it, again, it's all relative because it's it's shot up so much from that. I and mean, to your point, like they sell more food than they even sell beverages. And yes. So I'm a big I'm a big Pepsi guy too. Like Pepsi Coke, I'm all in on that. I just as much as I can get that stuff. And I don't drink soda. I don't get high on my own supply, as we say around. <laughs> <laughs> my kids like it, but you know, Brando. We need Brando. It has electrolytes. <laughs> oh, dude! Now you're gonna don't get me started on Idiocracy. Did you know in Idiocracy that they wanted to Mike Judge wanted to find footwear 
for the people in the movie in the future to to wear just uh-huh. something that he thought would look so stupid that people would never be wearing uh and he found it and it turns out that if you go and watch the movie and look at what people are wearing it was a new footwear and that footwear was called crocs so yes <laughs> so i uh i've never worn crocs but it's, now i laugh because everybody's yeah. wearing crocs and a lot of ways we feel and if, if you're listening or watching and you haven't seen idiocracy do yourself a treat so go watch idiocracy okay. i it's a fantastic movie and it's a cult class sadly kind of accurate so if you want investing advice kind of watch that movie and see you know costco is still big there <laughs> yeah welcome to costco i love you <laughs> All right. Well, that's, I think we've, we've made some All good right. ground. I hope we've, I, I, you have definitely given a lot to think about and you've given some good knowledge and it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's like, yeah. who are the people in your neighborhood? Did you remember Mr. Rogers? I'm not going to sing it. Who are the people <laughs> in your neighborhood? And that's, that's about as much of it as I remember, but he would meet the yeah. people in his neighborhood and we meet the people in our community. So it was a yes. pleasure to meet you, Sean. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Russ. Thanks for having me on. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, maybe you don't want people to get in touch with you. Is you is there anywhere that they can you can um, have a link? You know, yeah. I I'm or on do you want to be private? And, yeah, no, I'm on TikTok. I got I just put out funny videos and stuff. We do uh, some um, dividend stuff too. But my my um, handle is S H A U N Y seven seven. So if you're into some dividend um, TikToks, you can find me on there. But uh, other than that, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I will have that linked below and hopefully you get a bump to your TikTok account, which I'm hey, definitely not. All right. Aware. You said TikTok. <laughs> you got an accent because I don't have an accent. It's so, you know, it's so right. weird that <laughs> I'm the, only, the whole world has an accent but me. It's crazy yeah, how that works you, out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right, everybody, check out Sean's TikTok and uh, and we will talk to you later.